we are going to be talking about the blessings of God. And now, I know what you may be thinking, like, this is a very vast subject matter, and I realize that, and no, I'm not going to give an all-inclusive uh, realm and notes of all the blessings that the Lord gives or all the blessings that the Lord has given. But what my hope and prayer is this morning that as we look at this vast topic, as we look at the blessings of God, my hope and prayer is that we will begin to see the many things around us, the many things that surround us in our world today that the Lord has blessed us with. And maybe see some areas that the Lord is, is working in so, and, and some ways that we can walk into all that He has and all that He is as we continue this journey, as we chase after Him. So this morning, talking about the blessings of God. And I feel like before we look at how we can walk into the blessings of the Lord, we must first look at all that He has done for us. All, all the blessings that the Lord has given to us up until this point, the, the ones that He's already given. And I know there was a, uh, an old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One, Count Your Many Blessings, See What God Has Done. And that's a hymn that we've sung so many times, I know, growing up. And, and there was one moment in my life I remember growing up that I have a bad habit and I say have because I'm still plagued with it today. I'm getting better. Um, but a bad habit of spouting my mouth off without thinking sometimes. And so growing up, I remember focusing on what my friends had, what we didn't have, or um, saying that mom was trying to get us to say, and dad was trying to get us to say that we're blessed, and we're like, well, are we really? And so that hymn popped up, and I got to fully embrace what that hymn meant because my parents had me write down blessings, and they're like, um, you have a roof over your head. You missed that one. Write it down. And so I literally had to start counting my blessings and, and listing them out as part of my punishment slash encouragement to not uh, speak that anymore. But, but through that, I remember because it was, it was a time that really made me stop unwillingly, but I, I had to stop and think through all the many things that maybe I take for granted. The many things that, that we are truly blessed with that, that we don't think about on a normal daily basis. And so today, that is my hope. And, and no, I'm not going to have you list off in, on, on your notes like every blessing that you've ever experienced. But my hope and prayer is that we take into account and, and we remember and we thank God and we praise Him for the blessings that He's already done. But we also see where He's blessing now so we can be a part of that and we can walk in his blessings so first off as we as we dive into that we see and because i'm a pastor this is an alliteration meaning that all they're going to start with the letter p i thought that's pretty fancy um, but that's how we're going to roll today so first off we see position and you may be like what what are you talking about position well everywhere you are you're in a position whether you realize it or not, you have been placed in this position by the Lord. You have been anointed and appointed for the position you're in. What I love about this is regardless of where you find yourself today, this is true. You know, you may be sitting there, well, I, I am, I'm in a hard sick circumstance. Trust, the Lord is there with you. He's got a plan. You have, you have been put in this position to, to bring the Lord into that position, into that place. And you are appointed and anointed in that position to speak the word of the Lord and to bring light to Him. We're reading a book as, as a staff. It's by Pastor Craig Rochelle. It's the book, Lead Like It Matters. And I love what one of the books is actually in chapter 7. Um, I know that because I led our staff through that chapter this last week, and it, was, it just hit me like crazy. But it says, uh, Craig Rochelle states that whenever you're tempted to whine about what you don't have, remember that God has given you everything you need to do what He wants you to do. I'm going to read that again so we just grasp it. Whenever you're tempted to whine about what you don't have, remember that God has given you everything that you need to do what he wants you to do. I love that statement because regardless of where we find ourselves today, the Lord has put us in the position that we're in. We are anointed and appointed. You are equipped in that position to do the task that the Lord has set before you. We must step into that, that he, all that he has. We must step into that position and look around and say, the Lord has put me here. There's no other reason to it. It's not coincidence that you find yourself where you're at today. But we must look for the Lord in those times. 
I love this statement because it's something that I've actually had to fight and walk through through the last decade or so of my ministry um, experience. This is something that, that the Lord is continuing to grow me through and, and, and work on me and mold me and shape me through this because there's been a number of churches that I've served at that have had some people smarter than me. I know it's hard to imagine. I like syllables of three or less in the words that I choose to use. But, but I, I, I've had the opportunity to minister at churches that, that have had people that were very educated or, or very well experienced. And, and so one church actually that I served at, there were several retired ministers. Several ministers that, pardon me, sorry. Ministers that had spent their whole lives in the ministry, and some of them had doctorates. There was, there was a couple people that had even been seminary professors, and they said, here, you as a youth pastor, go preach the word of the Lord to the body. And, and it was something that I had to deal with, because what, what I had to see is, I was looking at my resume and saying, God, why and how? They could spell words that I didn't even know were words. So God, what, what do I have to offer them? And the Lord was constantly molding me and shaping me. And this isn't a woe is me story. This is a story of victory of how the Lord can shape and continue to walk you through this, this hard thing. Because the Lord said, you know what, don't worry about it. You are equipped. Yeah, they may have more book smart, but I've put the anointing on you. I've appointed you for this position that you find yourself in. You are equipped for this moment. Not because of anything that you can do or the studying that you've done. It's because you you have moved out of the way and are allowing me to work in you and through you. Church, no matter where we find ourselves, if we allow ourselves to get out of the way, if we allow ourselves to just be that vessel and say, God, here I am. I'm surrendered fully to you. I don't understand what you're doing, but use me. It doesn't make sense why you choose me, but, but God, you know better than me. Here I am. Do something. And when we get to that point, of surrender, when we get to that point of relinquishing and moving ourselves out of the picture, that's when He is able to move freely in us and through us. That is when He is put on display. Every time before I speak, I have to pause and make sure I stop and say, God, remove me from the equation. Remove me from anything that I want to say. And this happened actually this morning. The Lord woke me up at 2.55 this morning, just wide awake. So I went in and made a pot of coffee, which I've, contrary to proper belief, only had one cup of that this morning. So I was sitting there at our kitchen table, and the Lord started, I opened up my computer, and I started reading through the message that I thought was from the Lord, and I suddenly felt the need to start deleting some stuff and adding more stuff, and I was like, man, that was a really good line. That was an awesome story. That was gonna, I was gonna get some tweets on that, and I was gonna get some love and some amens and some applause, and the Lord was saying, no, get yourself out of the equation. It's not about you. It's about me. I'm the one that came and died. I'm the one that came and, and lived a perfect life on this earth for everyone. Remove yourself from the equation and allow me to shine brighter. Because it's, if it's up to Tyler Rudick and the life of Tyler Rudick, we're all in trouble. If it depends upon me and my abilities and my skills and even my mindset, we're in a world of hurt. But praise the Lord, it's not up to us. We just have to move out of the way and allow Him to be God and allow Him to move and say, God, I'm your vessel. Holy Spirit, speak through me because I'm not of eloquent tongue. I don't know what to say, but God, you speak through me. I love this because not only has I, have I seen it in my life, but I see it throughout the Bible. We see this number of times throughout God's word where he takes someone, someone that's unsuspected, someone that, that you would not see as someone to be used by the Lord, and he does some amazing things. You can look throughout the Bible, and you see David in 1 Samuel 17. He was a shepherd boy, this little shepherd boy that he wasn't even of age to go fight with his brothers. In fact, he brought the charcuterie board to his— see how I wove that in there? Sign up today. Um, that wasn't in my notes. But he brought the cheese tray to his, from his dad and from his family to his brothers. And they're like, what are you doing here? And he's like, 
That big dude's talking, this is my rendition. That big dude's talking about my God, and I'm not going to have any of it. So he said, I'll fight him. So Saul puts the armor on. You know the story. And he's like, bro, I can't walk in this. I can't move. I can't fight. I'm going to die. So he takes that off and grabs some stones and says, I'm going to take care of him, not in my name, because I'm just a little pipsqueak. I'm going to go in the name of the Lord, because that's where the authority is, and that's where the power is. So what does he do? God uses this little shepherd boy to come and defeat Goliath and become a king. A shepherd boy who had no earthly idea what it meant to be important. Instead, he had a heart just willing to listen to God. He had a heart that said, God, here I am. It doesn't make sense. That guy is so much bigger than I am. But God said, go. And he said, all right, I'm trusting you. We see Peter, and we all know Peter's story. We all know his issues. But Peter was this poor fisherman that became a disciple and became a fisher of men. Jesus said in Matthew 4, he said, hey, come follow me. And he's like, peace out, boat, family, fish, disgustingness. I'm going with him. In that moment, Jesus called and he said, I don't know where he's taking me. I don't know what he's doing. But he said, come follow me, and I'm going. And we all know how Peter, that ended up for Peter. Peter is a loose cannon with a knife and a sword later on, but, but Jesus can still use him. We see Esther in Esther 8. He was, she was born into exile and a woman, but then she came to bring the saving to the Jews. She came to rescue, redeem through the power of God. God used this woman, the second class citizens in this time, to do an amazing thing. And then Mary and Joseph. Joseph being a carpenter. To be used for the Lord. And Mary saying, I'm a teenager. What are my friends going to say, God, that I'm, that I'm pregnant and I'm not even married? God, I'm, I'm a teenager and I don't know anything about raising a baby, much less the Son of God. How can this be? But what does she say? Lord, here I am. I don't understand it, but may it be so like you have said. I'm here. I'm yours. Have your way. These individuals, and there's so many more throughout the Bible of people that God uses that, that wouldn't, that have been discarded by the world. So I'm here to tell you, church, regardless of what the world has said, regardless of maybe what your family or your job has said, regardless of all that, The Lord has called you unique. He has equipped you. And he says, you are worth something huge if you get out of the way and allow me into your life. Allow me to take control. Allow me to steer the ship. We've all seen the bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. I want to go rip those off because, no offense, if you have one, I won't touch your vehicle. But here's the deal. If I can reach the steering wheel, we're still in trouble. I need to get myself into the trunk and say, Jesus, you could have the whole front seat because I want you control and I don't want to be in arm's reach of that steering wheel. God, I want to get out of the way to let you have your way because your ways are so much better and so much higher than my ways. I love what Christine Kane says. She said, God doesn't call the qualified. He call, qualifies the called. I'm going to say that again because I feel like this right here is going to speak to more of us if we allow it to us. God doesn't call the qualified. Instead, he qualifies the called. Because I believe today in this room and online that people can hear this voice. I believe that there are people that are saying, I I know God is pushing me to this ministry or God is pushing me into this avenue, but it's uncomfortable and I don't understand it. I'm not equipped yet. I don't know how to do it. I'm not a good speaker. I get scared to read book reports in front of a class. Anything that I create by my fingers and type, I don't want to read it because I don't think it's good enough. Those are battles I've had to face, but God doesn't call the qualified. He says, hey, don't worry about getting yourself cleaned up. Come to me and let me take care of that. I will equip you. I will give you everything you'll need. I will fulfill you and sustain you. I will complete you if you allow me to. Church, I don't know where you're at this morning, but wherever you find yourself, 
You need to know that you are called, that you are anointed and appointed by the Lord right there where you are, whether that's being a stay-at-home mom, whether it's driving a school bus or a trash truck, whether it's, it's being retired. The Lord is not done with you. You are called for a purpose. We must say yes to him. Here I am. God, I'm old, I'm old of age, but you haven't taken me home. I'm here. Use me. God, I'm, I'm a junior high student, a high school student. I don't know. I don't want people to make fun of me, but I'm here. Use me, whatever it takes. Wherever we find ourselves, we must realize we are in that position for a purpose of the Lord. We are there in that position, and we've been called and anointed and appointed. We have been equipped by the Lord. We just need to get out of the way and allow him to lead. Not only is it our position, but we also see the provision. We also see provision. And I'm not just talking about because you heard this story and heard this message this morning that you're going to walk out and immediately your wallet's going to be a lot bigger. I'm not talking about that this morning. But I'm talking about Jesus as he is teaching throughout his ministry that we should look to him for everything. Not our own abilities, not our own possibilities of manufacturing things, but looking to Him. I love the fact that we just sang that song a few minutes ago. The line says this, Jesus, you don't owe me anything. I just want you. Is that our prayer this morning, or are we, or are we saying, yeah, but, but how is that going to pay the bills, or how is that going to make ends meet? How, how is that going to sustain? I, I know trusting God with everything, that, that sounds great, but, but really, how do I type that in when it's asking for my credit card number to pay the electric bill? Turn to God for everything. He is the provider of all things. I love this story in the Gospels, and this is one of our favorite bedtime stories, and this is kind of how we tell it um, to our four-year-old. But Jesus and the disciples, there's a lot of people he's been teaching all day, and, and you know the story, and they're hungry, and the disciples are like, well, how can we feed them? And Jesus said, what do you have? The disciples are like, hey, little buddy has the Lunchable, that's what we got. And Jesus says, go with me, it's in the Bible, but this is my rendition of it, it's fish and loaves, so I just want to clarify that just to make sure. He says, okay, I'm going to take this Lunchable which is going to take several of them to fill me up, side note. But here's this Lunchable. And the Lord said, you know what? I'm going to bless it. I'm going to break it. And what does he do? He does that, and he provides for 5,000. And guess what? They had snack packs left over. Okay, that's too far. But they had leftovers at that moment. He took something so small, some fish and some loaves, fed the masses, and they still picked up leftovers, something that doesn't make a lick of scientific sense. It, Jesus makes a way. I can't tell you how many times in my life, in my family's life, we were on the mission field, that checks came in the mail that were just to the dollar amount. I went and preached and spoke at a place, and I received some, it was an obscure number. And I was kind of puzzled by that. But I got home two days later, my windshield broke, and it had to be replaced, and it was to the dollar, I kid you not, to the dollar of what that replacement was. Our God knows how to provide for us if we allow him, if we step into that, if we look to him to come through and not just say, God, I think I've got a plan, but I, I think I'm good. No, to say, God, here I am. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm trusting you, though. I'm stepping out in faith. It doesn't make sense. But, God, I know you're powerful. I know you're there. I know you can make a way when there is no way. In Matthew 6, it talks about that. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, it says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, or, or nor about your body. What you will put on is, is life not more than food, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Did you guys catch that? Are you not more valuable than they? Verse 27, and which of you, by being anxious, can add another hour to your life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. 
how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like them. But if, if God closes the, clothes the grass in the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? But for the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Catch verse 33. Actually, before I go on there, I love the fact that, that we're walking through all this stuff and he's saying, don't worry about these things. Look at the animals. They're not freaking out about this. They're not worried and toiling about all this. And God takes care of them. And what about you? You are the ones made in the very image of God as we read in Genesis. We are made in his image. Is he not going to take care of us? So why fret and why worry? So he's walking in and it says, but instead, there's a big but right here in verse 33. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added into you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient that for the day is its own trouble. I love this in this passage because it tells us from whom all things come from. Verse 33, it says, yeah, all these things come from God, so seek first his kingdom. The noise of the world is getting louder and louder by the minute, but we need to turn off the noise, and we need to focus on his kingdom. We need to focus on him first and foremost. We need to be looking right at him. We know the story of Peter on the water, what happens when he takes his eyes off Jesus. No, we need to focus on him and his kingdom first and foremost. And then what does it say? And then it will be added to you seek first his kingdom we must ask ourselves what am I seeking am I seeking my own kingdom am I, own, am I seeking my own fame or popularity or my own good or my own accomplishments things that I've created because the world will say you go and get yours or am I saying every day my desire is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all the other stuff will fall into line. All the other stuff will fall into place. When I say, I'm going to get up and the first thing I want to think about is God and the Lord and say, thank you, Jesus, for another day. Where are we going today? Where would you have me go today? Instead of, I think today's a good day for this or that. Are we seeking first his kingdom above all else? So we've seen position, provision, and thirdly, proximity. Proximity. Jeremiah 23 and verses 23 and 24 says, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in a secret place that I cannot see him? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. Proximity. I remember as a kid, growing up with boys, there were four of us, there were many times that things got lost. It's just what happened. Many times we'd be searching, and, and mom would say, go find that. And so we're like, we're looking, and, and we're looking and looking, and we couldn't find it. And I remember this saying, I don't understand where they got it from, but I remember it because they said it so many times. Because whenever we'd find it, it was always like right in front of our faces. And mom and dad would say, well, if that was a snake, it would have bit you. They don't stand like that or talk like that. I don't know why I did that. But they said, if that was a snake, it would have bit you, meaning like it was right there the whole time. And as I, as I contemplated why, why that popped up in my head this week, I don't know. But as I was thinking about that, I couldn't separate the notion and the thought and the idea. Isn't that the same way with the Lord and the blessings of God and the things that he is doing? Don't so many times we start looking for things and we're like, oh, we start looking and looking and looking and looking and can't see it. We're, we're, we're focused so far beyond. And then sometimes we, we get distracted because we're, we're, we're focused so, so quick and so short of notice here. When it's right in front of us the whole time. We've, 
We've clouded our vision with all these other things. We've seen all this other stuff instead of opening our eyes to what is in front of us. And the Lord is near. In Psalm 145, it says that the Lord is near to all who call on Him. To all who call on Him in truth. This week I also, there's a lot of reminiscing that happened in my mind this last week. But I remember back our church in 7th grade in 1996 in Sealing, Oklahoma. We went through Henry Blackaby's Experiencing God Bible Study. Some of you guys may remember that. And, and one of the phrases that I remember, I don't even know how many years ago that was, but 96 is a few. But one of the phrases that I remember, it says, find out where God is working and join him. Find out where the Lord is working and join him. So in order to do that, we have to have our eyes open. We have to be looking on the prowl constantly, alert, looking around to see where the Lord is working so that we know what direction to head so we can be right in the middle of all that he has for us. We need to start looking for him and where he's at work. So we don't miss out on what he is doing. So we can walk in that. Not so that we can be a part of something cool and we can get pats on the back. No, so that we can join in his effort to advance his kingdom. To press forward against enemy lines. To reach more people for his kingdom. We need to see where is the Lord at work. And I don't want to miss. I don't want to be over here randomly working and toiling on something. When the Lord's over here doing an amazing work. We must keep our eyes open because many times he's at work around us. We just, our vision's gotten cloudy or we've been distracted. And as we mentioned earlier, if we're seeking him first and his kingdom first, we're probably going to find out that he was closer than we thought. He is closer than what we had thought. And as we do that, as we realize our position in his provision and what he's doing around us, we will see the blessings of God. We can can see the blessings of God and then we can walk in them. I love what Psalm 1 says, starting in verse 1. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates both day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and the leaf doesn't wither. In all he does, he prospers. There's a few things I love about this. And a few things I want to note about walking into the blessings of God. Because we see in verse 1, it says, Blessed are those who do not walk in in the wicked's counsel or, or sit in the seat of scoffers. It doesn't say that we're not supposed to associate with them at all. Because we see Jesus himself, he met with the sinners. He loved on the sinners. He invested in their lives, but he was not influenced by them. He didn't allow them to cloud because he was rooted into something greater and something deeper so that he would not be swayed from left to right. It's, it's imploring us right here to not follow their ways, not allowing them to influence us, but to still get close enough so they can see the love of the Savior. And it goes on to say, and his delight is in the Lord in verse 2. This was a statement that, that puzzled me for, for so many years growing up because I'm like, delight in the law. How, how does one take pleasure or, or delight or to give joy to the law? But it means to delight in God's word or to take pleasure, or in simple words, here we go. It means to enjoy the word of God. I know when I was growing up, I was like, Dad, I don't know how you enjoy this. It's so hard. I'm like, who, what is, who, what is a begot? What does that even mean? And so there's so much stuff in there that I was like, I don't understand. And slow baby steps. I remember one time asking my dad, I was like, I, how do you, 
how do you make time to read the Bible? I don't have enough time. To which he quickly listed a number of things that I waste my time doing. And I said, but I just can't get into it. And he said, and I've said this so many times because I will never forget it. He said, son, you will make time for what's important for you. And, and as I thought about that, as, it, as that hit me, that just blew my mind. And I was like, but how do you meditate on it day and night, not getting enough of it? How do you delight yourself in this? And then when I was in college, when I was in college, I prayed one of the most bold prayers I've ever prayed in my life. Because I didn't know what it would, how it would turn, off, turn out. I said, God, give me an unquenchable thirst and hunger for your word. Give me, give me a thirst and hunger for your word that's not going to be quenched by reading it one time through, by listening to the audio recordings of it. Give me a thirst that's not going to be able to be quenched. And after I prayed that prayer, the Lord lit a fire underneath me and I could not get enough of his work. Suddenly I was, I was diving in and I was like, man, there's some amazing stuff in there. The Lord did a work that I, was, that I was just consumed by it. I wanted to highlight the whole thing, but then I realized that that would make it, uh, that's counterintuitive because if the whole thing's highlighted, you can't really see anything anyways. It just wastes a lot of highlighter. But I was like, God, give me, give me this unquenchable thirst for your word. I want to know it. I want to pour it in so that I will have it. Because I was always amazed at people that could recite the word. So I said, God, give me this unquenchable thirst. And as he did that, man, I started reading. And there's some incredible things in here. There's some incredible things in the Bible. And yes, even the Old Testament. We see she-bears attacking some boy. Wait, there's not many kids in here. Okay. Um, some, some little boys that were bashing the prophet and calling names at the prophets. We see prophets of Baal slicing and dicing themselves. I mean, this is like rated R crazy entertainment blockbuster stuff in here. We see a talking donkey before Shrek made it cool. That's in God's word. And we see miracle after miracle. We see all these things in God's word. But I pray, God, give me unquenchable thirst. And I don't know how many times I've lost count, how many times I've read it through. And this isn't a pat me on the back. But it's my desire that I continue to pour in. Because mama told me that garbage in, garbage out. So I want to have all the good stuff I can have just to filter out all that other stuff. Because there was a season that I could not get enough of movies. And I was just wanted to have all the movie quotes. I wanted to dumbfound my brothers by they say something, I'd have a movie line right next. And then for a season we did. We would quote movies at the dinner table. We'd have the whole segment. But that was meaningless. Now I desire and say, God, let me consume your word in a manner that that's what it comes out whenever I open my mouth. That it just pours out from me because I've poured so much of it in. Psalm 119, verse 11. It says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. I've put so much of your word in my heart that, that it... it, it Anytime I think of a, a decision or anytime I'm tempted, it just oozes up within me and saying, no, there's a scripture about that. The Lord says something contrary to that. It's because you've poured so much of it into yourself. Joshua 1.8 speaks to that as well. It says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will have your way prosperous and will have good success. My desire is to fill myself so much with this that it oozes from me. That people know that they're going to get a touch of the scriptures whenever they come and have a conversation with me. My desire is to delight in the word of the Lord, to enjoy it so much that I can't get enough of it. That I'm meditating on it. So church, I have a question for us that we have to think about. What are we meditating on today? 
What is filling our hearts and our thoughts and our minds today? Is it the things of the Lord? Are we pouring all that we can of the Lord into ourselves to fill us up? Or is it, yes, it's good whenever we go to camp or I have some spare moments and that's my quiet time for the day. Is it an, oh no, I'm in need and I'm going to reach for this? Or is it a weapon for whenever the schemes of the enemy come? Because we see Jesus when he was in the, was it, when in the wilderness, when he was tempted, when he was out and Satan came and threw scripture at him. It was misquoted and misused and out of context. And Jesus took the true word of God and fought off the schemes of the enemy. Is that what is filling us? Is that what we're meditating on? We must take an examination of our lives to see what are we filling up ourselves with? Maybe someone here today needs to say, you know what, I need to empty myself because I filled it with all the things of the world. And so for the Lord to fill me with all that He is and all that He has, I need to first empty myself so there's room. I need to empty myself of all the things of the flesh, all the things of the world, all the things that I try to manufacture stuff in and put in there to make me happy, to make me content, to all those things that I've stuffed in every nook and cranny. Maybe it's saying I need to get that out so that I can allow all that the Lord is to come and fill me up and not just to full capacity but to overflow. What are we filling ourselves with today? May it be of Him and His kingdom and not our own. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you. God, I thank you for who you are and what you've done, Father. God, I thank you for all the blessings around us. And Father, I pray that you would help us. And we need to apologize for being distracted and not allowing ourselves to see all the many things that you're at work around us. Jesus, we are so grateful for your presence, for your power, for all that you've done for us and around us. And so God, I pray right now that if there's one in here today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their lives over to you and stop trying to do it themselves. Or maybe there's one in here today that has given you their life, but they're still holding on to a bunch of things. God, may we release that. May we be emptied of all the things that we've put inside us. May we be emptied of all the things that we've manufactured. May we be emptied of all the things not of you so that you can truly fill us. So, Father, we ask you to have your way with us today and in this place. And God, as your word says in Jeremiah, may we be a people blessed by trusting in the Lord. May we be like a tree that is planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. May we not fear when the heat comes, for our leaves will remain green. May we not be anxious in the year of drought because of you will not cease to bear fruit. So God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. And God, I thank you for your people. I said you bless them and keep them. May your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. May you lift them up and your countenance be upon them. May you give them peace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to invite someone to free Fall Festival next weekend. Pastor Bill will be back week two of Not Today Satan next Sunday. Thank you so much. Have a great day.